This group also serves the entire sort of nurse user base, which is about 7,000 users across the globe. Uh, so if you have any questions on using the nurse machines, the DAS group is sort of the first place to go to. Uh, Prabhat also wears many hats. He's a computer scientist by training, but he also works across a broad range of sciences, uh, as you'll see today. Uh, and he's published in pretty much every domain science and computer science. Uh, and most recently, the award uh, that sort of shot the DAS group into fame was the uh, Gordon Bell Prize last year. Thank you. All right, thanks. Thanks, Karthik. Um, so I do want to thank you all for you know, sharing your lunch here. Um, there is a tendency to enjoy lunch in, in the great California weather. So um, uh, thanks for you know, bearing with me, I, I guess, over the next uh, hour or so. So um, I'm, I'm going to be talking broadly about deep learning for science. I think much of the foundational stuff that has been covered in, in the first uh, couple of days has been you know, fairly generic. Uh, but this is the deep learning for science summer school. So I think we are slowly transitioning into science topics. And what this talk is going to do is to give you a very broad perspective on uh, what classes or applications can benefit from, from deep learning. So very early on, I think I do want to call out that when people think about data analytics uh, at NERSC, in, in other supercomputing centers, in science broadly, there is really a, a broad set of tools that one can bring to bear. So I think Brenda, uh, early on Monday, had a slide that showed you know, on the left side AI and then machine learning being a subset of AI and then deep learning being a subset of uh, machine learning. But really, broadly, there are many, many methods that you can bring to bear. And chances are that you know, as a student, as a postdoc, as a researcher, you already are using several of these methods. So classical linear algebra is obviously relevant. Um, you, know, you might have classical image or signal processing tasks that are uh, important, useful. In some cases, in science, graphs and doing graph analytics becomes important. And really, I'll call out that statistics, in many ways, is the foundational technology beyond, behind machine learning and deep learning. So that's something to keep in mind. Obviously, people have vanilla you know, statistical significance tests on and so forth. Those will always be important, always be relevant for scientific data analysis. Now, of course, you know, the AI revolution, the, the third wave of deep learning is upon us. It's impossible to ignore the, the three circles on, on the left. But uh, you know, just keep in mind that as a day-to-day -day practitioner, you will be using many of these uh, tools uh, down the line. Now, I think another message maybe in this slide is that it is not the case that deep learning is going to subsume and replace other classical analytics techn technologies or methods. That's not the case. Deep learning will be one of several things that you'll be able to use. So, um, you know, I, I do need to do justice to the institution uh, that funds us. So the Department of Energy has been systematically tracking uh, what scientists are saying about their needs. So we run all of these requirements, gatherings, workshops across all of the offices, so nuclear physics, high energy physics, uh, biological and environmental research, fusion, uh, basic energy sciences. And when we talk to scientists across the board in the DOE, and I suspect this is true for NSF or NASA or other agencies, I think in the bottom of passion, they are saying that they would really like access to advanced statistics and advanced machine learning capabilities. So I think we see that requirement coming you know, bottom up. Now, the DOE is, you know, I would say, fashionably late to deep learning. Um, all of these things took off in 2012. I think we've been uh, certainly running a lot of workshops, capturing requirements. So we ran a couple of workshops wherein I think it was articulated what the, the, uh, the deep learning requirements were and what potential approaches there might be. So I'm going to chat a little bit about these three classes of applications in, in the next slide. We are shortly going to have, and, and by the way, these are the two workshop reports that came out of those two uh, uh, meetings. Shortly, in the next two or three months, we're going to have a bunch of AI town halls in the DOE, wherein um, uh, many researchers will essentially, I think, try to articulate what the open challenges are in domain sciences and what needs to happen differently in the computer science area to accommodate uh, you know, these, these emerging requirements. You may know that there is now a presidential AI initiative, which is really um, helping, I think, various federal agencies launch programs in AI. Now, the reason I put this up uh, is because as students, as postdocs, as researchers, this is top-down funding coming to you soon. So, you know, you, you probably ought to either prepare yourself or um, team up with others to respond to funding calls when they become available to you. All right. So um, just to be concrete now, um, you know, when we talk to scientists uh, and we say, so you, know, you say you want to do statistics or you, you want to do machine learning or deep learning, what is it that you mean? What is, it, what is the specific problem that you want to solve? So this is my attempt at tabulating uh, various domain science areas in the DOE, specific 
areas like astronomy, cosmology, particle physics, climate, genomics, light sources, material science, ion colliders, plasma physics, along columns. And then along rows are typical statistical tasks that you might want to solve. So perhaps you have a pattern classification problem. Hopefully you know what that means by now. Maybe you have a regression problem. I think you know, Brenda called out early on on Monday, you want to predict a continuous value quantity. Those are typically cast as supervised problems. Then you have a range of unsupervised problems, so clustering or dimensionality reduction. Uh, there's the anomaly detection task. And then we also have tasks like uh, designing inexpensive surrogate models uh, or essentially designing experiments. So broadly, I think in the DOE, we are leaning towards bunching up these, and I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that, everywhere where there is an X on this table means that that domain science has that uh, requirement. So in the DOE, I think we are bunching these requirements into three classes of applications. So all of these applications, pattern classification, regression, clustering, dimensional reduction, anomaly de detection, you can think of as, uh, as analytics prompts. So really the vast majority of, of tasks is in this space. More and more, I think what we are realizing is that um, despite all of the big X scale, pre exascale class machines that we have, it is still not possible for us to simulate the universe in all of its exquisite fidelity. So we do need to uh, design surrogate models. And that's where, you know, can deep learning help augment, replace, enhance current simulation tools? That's where that comes into play. Now, the last one, deep learning for control, is an interesting um, topic. If you have, say, a light source or a telescope or a microscope or a network or a supercomputer or a data center, uh, can you somehow control it more efficiently? So the self-driving car analogy, you know, how does that apply to the DOE? So that's where control comes in. So we do think that um, you know, a, a table of this form, these three buckets sort of broadly characterize what the DOE might want to do, uh, need to do in, in this space. All right. So um, I think over the last two days, and I'm sure even before that, I, I think you all know this by now that deep learning is working in the industry. Right? So state-of-the-art results in computer vision, state-of-the-art speech recognition results, game-playing systems, um, you know, self-driving car systems, everything is being deployed in practice. So around five years ago, we ourselves are, asked ourselves this question, well, deep learning is working. I mean, I think we see this coming. Uh, so it works for commercial applications, but can it work for science? So there are certainly similarities between deep learning for the industry and, and deep learning for science. And the similarities are in the kinds of tasks that we need to solve. So we certainly, you know, have pattern classification, regression, you know, so on and so forth tasks. But there are some differences. Um, in, in particular, scientific data looks different. Um, you know, we have many more channels than just RGB. Uh, our channels typically are associated with high precision or high accuracy. The kinds of noise and artifacts that we have in scientific data are very different from what you might see in a commodity uh, camera. But most importantly, uh, the structure of patterns, structure of clusters, structure of anomalies are very different from what you might see in the ImageNet data set. So um, I, I think, you know, my favorite analogy is if you have a megapixel camera and you go around clicking images of the world, uh, every image is one point in a million dimensional space. Now, a contemporary climate simulation has about a million pixels as well. So every image, every frame from a climate simulation is uh, a point in a different million dimensional space. And now the question is, you know, the clusters corresponding to cats and dogs and bedrooms and so on and so forth uh, in your commercial images uh, are likely going to be quite different from the, the patterns corresponding to uh, cyclones and hurricanes and so on and so forth. So the, the question to ask really is, can deep learning as a piece of statistical inference machinery learn to separate out patterns in both of these spaces? And obviously, you, you know, you won't have a workshop, you won't have a talk on this unless this was working. So uh, over the last, uh, again, five years, um, we've been systematically exploring deep learning for a range of applications. And yes, sure enough, we find that you know, it seems to work. About three years ago, we wrote this O'Reilly blog. Three years feels like a very, very long time now. Um, but we wrote this O'Reilly blog on, um, on the, the patterns, or essentially, I think, the success stories that we were seeing at that point in time. I'm going to touch upon some of these uh, later today. But um, you know, feel free to check out that blog uh, later on. All right, so what I want to do next is to walk through uh, one science area, climate science in detail, and then uh, you know, just skim through a few other use cases you know, Karthik had a breakout on deep learning for climate yesterday. So I think some of you have seen these slides before, uh, but I'll just, you know, go through these nevertheless. So for us, you know, at Berkeley Lab, in the DAS group, uh, we really care about science questions. I mean, in the end, at the end of the day, 
um, you know, we, we need to be able to target an important science problem and solve it with deep learning. So in this case, the important science problem that we're going after is to understand climate change. Uh, in, in particular, um, climate change so far, you know, has been characterized by very simplistic quantities. Uh, how is the global annual mean temperature going to change by the end of the century? How is the sea level going to rise by the end of the century? So even though you have a million pixels on an image, uh, you're compressing all of that data, uh, you know, a year's worth of information down to a single number. And then all you try to track is how that number change, or changes over 100 years. But, you know, there is exquisite fidelity in such data sets. So if you were, if you were to pull out some satellite images, for example, uh, you, can, you, know, you can see a hurricane brewing uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. You can see an atmospheric river making landfall in, in California. You can see an extropical cyclone in the Northeast. Uh, you can see a weather front. So uh, more and more people who care about climate change and its impact in the places where you live, you know, in a city like Berkeley or New York or so on and so forth, they want to find whether these patterns are going to make Im essentially impact them where, where they live. I think the, the good news here is that we have now climate models that can produce uh, such patterns. So this is a state-of-the-art CAM5 quarter degree model. And you can see that these simulations can produce tropical cyclones and atmospheric rivers, uh, extropical cyclones, and other weather, uh, other weather patterns. So it's certainly within our capability to simulate potentially you know, what will happen in the future. But now imagine uh, if this movie, instead of you know, playing out for four months, if this movie had played out for 100 years or 1,000 years, there is no way that you as a human expert or a scientist could reliably, uh, in an unbiased fashion, pull out where these patterns are. So you really need uh, a computer vision capability, an automatic tool to find patterns in such large data sets. Now, I can replace this climate simulation by maybe a time-elapsed you know, microscope image, uh, maybe a time-elapsed uh, telescope data set. So the analogy still holds true in that you have uh, massive amounts of spatial temporal data that you want to be automatically analyzing and finding patterns in. So, uh, you know, again, if we draw uh, an analogy between what needs to happen in the computer vision context for, uh, you know, images of cats and dogs versus what needs to happen in science, we, we share the same problems. We, given a data set, uh, we need to say whether, you know, uh, is, there a, is there a pattern? Is there a cat in this image or not? Uh, we need to solve the localization problem, you know, draw me tight bonding boxes around the object of interest. Uh, for, in the detection formulation of the problem, given an image with multiple objects overlapping, occluded, so on and so forth, uh, we might want to, you know, find out essentially three different kinds of bonding boxes, all variably positioned and, and sized. And then finally, the segmentation is, is the problem wherein, you know, these boxes aren't good enough. You really need a per pixel uh, prediction on, on where these patterns are. So over the last three years, we've essentially shown that one can apply deep learning to all of these problems and, and get straight up the art results. That, that's totally doable. So what I'm going to do next is to walk you through three slides um, which touch upon what kinds of architectures we've developed to solve these, uh, these problems. So first, uh, you know, about three years ago, it was unclear in our minds on whether deep learning could be applied to the output of a simulation. Like I mentioned, these two spaces, these two million dimensional spaces, real images and simulation output are very different. So, um, you know, we started with a fairly simple AlexNet style architecture. So again, a simple input, input layer, um, uh, convolution pooling layers, fully connected layer, and then uh, the, the job of the network is to predict a binary label. You know, is there a, uh, is there a tropical cyclone in this image or not? Uh, a different network predicts, is there an atmospheric river in this event or not? you know, a, a third network predicts whether there's a better front of this image or not. Now, I think one of the things that we did carefully, and I, you know, would certainly encourage you all to do the same as well, is that apart from implementing this AlexNet thing, we did do due diligence and implement other baseline machine learning architectures. So simple logistic regression, simple k-nearest neighbors, support vector machines, random forests. And of course, you know, there are parameters associated with many of these methods, so you do some form of hyperparameter optimization, make sure that you've chosen reasonable parameters, given these methods the best chance that they can on, on this data set, and see how well they do. So yes, indeed, I think we found that, uh, you know, deep learning based methods do give you state of the art accuracy. Uh, but I think most importantly, one of the things that we learned early on was that all of the numbers, the, the predictive accuracies were all fairly high. So all numbers are 85% or higher. So uh, I think this was a very important lesson learned in that I think that there may be a tendency to just jump to deep learning as the very first thing you try. And uh, I think it's important to first characterize how easy or hard the problem is to begin with. 
there are pros and cons in using deep learning. Um, so I think if you can maybe apply some simpler methods and slowly work up the complexity, try, you know, at, at, at some point justify why you're using deep learning, that may be worthwhile. Um, all right, so I think that exercise proved that uh, convolutional architectures could handle uh, spatial data sets produced by simulation and, and the binary classification problem was, was approachable. So then what we did was to come up with a semi-supervised architecture. So again, the, the problem, the challenge here being that while we may have labels for perhaps two or three classes in this data set, uh, there are many other patterns that we do not have labeled data for. Um, so essentially what the semi-supervised architecture tries to do is to take your input data set. Uh, there is a, by now I think you've seen these convolutional architectures. Um, uh, there is essentially a bottleneck layer and you're gonna ask the architecture to make predictions of uh, patterns, box locations, and class type uh, for labels that it has, for types that it has. But the, the semi-supervised bit in that there is an unsupervised component to this architecture wherein you force this architecture to recreate, um, you know, match the dimensionality of the input, produce images that match the spatial size and also the, the number of channels that the data set has. Uh, but the, the constraint here being uh, that you force this network to go through a bottleneck layer. So if this can be made to work, um, if a, a single network can both produce accurate labels, uh, boxes, and recreate the data set, then it probably means that this, that this bottleneck layer has essentially learned uh, all of the interesting patterns. So that's it's effectively become a meaningful uh, latent representation of the data set. So after, and by the way, I should mention that, you know, I have not done all of this work. There are a number of folks who've been contributing to these projects and, they're all called out in, in the bottom of the slide. So there, these are some folks from Mila that we, that we worked with. So the output of this trained network um, uh, you know, looks like the following. So essentially you have a global image. There are multiple weather patterns in this image. So ground truth is in green. So you have many tropical cyclones. You have an extropical cyclone. You have an atmospheric river. And then red is what the network is predicting. So a single network is predicting these three events and their locations. Obviously there are artifacts, you know, there are, we are missing out on a few events, the scale isn't quite right and there is an offset, uh, but you know, that, that was a known limitation of this architecture at that point in time. I should say that when we attempted this, when we tried to run semi-supervised learning at scale on this big data set, uh, we found out quickly enough that you could not run this on a single GPU or a single CPU. Uh, so essentially what we, do, what we did was to scale this architecture to all of Cori, so Cori is the the machine that we have at NERSC has about, say, 10,000 uh, nights landing nodes. And we were successful in scaling this architecture out to all of the Cori system. At that point in time, I think the conventional wisdom was that deep learning would not work well on, on CPUs. But I think we proved that you can get a fairly high level of performance in, in scaling this out. So this is the, the largest example of a deep learning application on a CPU-based system. Uh, we were able to achieve 15 petaflops uh, you know, of, of performance in, in scaling this out. The next step uh, you know, in that slide is segmentation. So that, again, is a, is a much more computationally demanding task. Um, so this is the, the Tiramisu UNET architecture that we used. Um, you probably have seen versions of, of this by now, I guess, in, in the summer school. The input image is, is a million pixels with 16 channels, and the output image is, is a million pixels with three channels. Uh, you know, the different channels correspond to uh, pixel-wise. You know, is there a tropical cyclone here? Is there an atmospheric river here? Or is it just background? Uh, there is an encoder piece. So again, you start off with you know, this big representation. You essentially come up with a compact representation. Uh, and then there is a decoder piece that will produce an image of the same native resolution as the data set. A bunch of skip connections. It's, it's really hard to get such deep networks to, to converge. Um, so we, you know, we use that as well. Now, when we optimized this and ran this on a single voltage GPU, essentially what we found is that just passing one image through this entire network requires about 40 teraflops worth of compute. And we had, I think, about 200,000 images. So you really need a large-scale compute resource to get this thing to run and, and converge. So, um, so we did that um, on the Summit system. So Summit is the number one machine in, in the DOE and actually around, around the world. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we were successful in scaling this unit architecture um, on 27,000 Volta GPUs. And for the first time, uh, I guess in the community, uh, this particular deep learning application was able to exceed an exaflop. So that's a billion, billion floating point operations per second in half precision in FP16 mode. And uh, you know, everything hung together at that point. So the code was working, the thing was converging, scaling well, so on and so forth. 
but we care about science, I guess, in this, in this talk. So uh, this is what the final result of the train network is. You give it a global image, 16 channels, million pixels, and out comes you know, all of these prediction masks. So uh, the, the black contour lines are what uh, human heuristic has specified the ground truth is. And uh, the dots, the blue dots and the red dots are what the network is predicting, you know, wh where the features are. So we do see a fairly you know, high quality uh, agreement between the human heuristic and, um, and the network output. You know, Karthik talked about climate net yesterday. I'm not gonna go there, but um, there is a bottleneck here in that uh, what we've shown proven so far is that deep learning based solutions can match human heuristics, but we wanna bypass human heuristics completely. So climate net is a project that essentially is, you know, is headed in that direction. So I think as Karthik mentioned, uh, you know, this particular project won the Gordon Bell Prize last year. So you know, I find it really uh, remarkable that you know, we had the Turing Award for the AI, AI grandfathers, I guess, in the same year. And then after that, in the field of HPC, this is the biggest award. And again, that's also in the AI space. So uh, again, I think uh, enabling a deep learning application to hit an X-flop is, is really a big, uh, big accomplishment that we've talked about for about 10 years now. All right, so I'm going to switch tracks now. Uh, so from climate science to cosmology, um, and we'll pick on two problems in cosmology. Uh, you know, one problem is, is, is around predicting cosmological constants. So again, it, it is very common in, in science, uh, especially in the computational approach to any science, to have a theoretical model, which you then code up and you run. Uh, but, uh, you know, often people are interested in knowing, does, does my theory, does the model actually make sense, does it match reality, so on and so forth. So uh, I think one of the things that we try to do is to take um, uh, these, these theory models. So essentially you plug in three numbers. There are eight or so, uh, but we plug in three numbers. We run out many, many simulations. Uh, we run, so given a choice of three parameters, we run uh, an n-body simulation to the age of uh, the, the universe. We end up uh, with a box with dark matter particles in it. Uh, and then essentially we turn this over to a deep learning system saying, hey, if I just gave you this box and I gave you a regression task in this, in that you're supposed to predict these three models, uh, model parameters, can you do a, can you do a good job at that? So um, there are some colleagues at CMU, uh, Shirley Ho and others, who essentially showed that yes, indeed, uh, a 3D convolutional architecture could solve this problem. So again, remember that a lot of your examples that you've seen so far are operating on 2D images, but in this case, you have a 3D volume. And, and again, remember that. 3D volume show up all over the place in science. So I think what was unique here is that we um, coded up a 3D convolutional architecture in TensorFlow, uh, and then again, scaled it out to, uh, you know, 8,000 core KNL nodes, got a fairly high level of performance. These are the, the network's predictions. So uh, the, the ground truth is, is in the diagonal line. And then uh, the model as having run on different um, concurrencies is, is able to match, I think, reasonably uh, the, the parameter estimates. So we are taking this work in a few other directions in the future, uh, predicting many more parameters. Um, when you try to create a 3D convolutional network, then things sometimes don't fit into memory. So uh, we are working on, you know, beyond data parallelism, coming up with a hybrid data model and pipeline parallelism techniques uh, to get these models to, to fit on, on big machines. Now, the next project uh, is, you know, Mustafa's project, right, sitting right here. Um, I think the last talk was, was really excellent in exposing you to GANs and how GANs are doing a, a wonderful job of you know, modeling the distributions of bedrooms and Persian cats and celebrity faces. Um, so, uh, you know, that's great. I mean, I think some of the, the features, the, the facial features that are being captured now are just remarkable. Um, but we care about maybe more socially meaningful applications. And um, I think the practical challenge here is that despite all of the big machines that we have uh, at our disposal, uh, we really cannot explore all of the parameters that, that can characterize the universe. So can we use a GAN, can we train a GAN to produce synthetic universes? Um, and um, you know, one, if, we can do the, if we can do so, if we can create a GAN that can produce a realistic universe, uh, then maybe we can explore um, uh, you know, essentially which, which parameters work best uh, and, and so on and so forth. So essentially what Mustafa did, again, a few years ago now, which again, you know, this work was done a couple of years ago. It's a remarkably long time ago, I guess, in, in uh, deep learning world, uh, is essentially to show that, yes, indeed, uh, you know, so a carefully constructed GAN can start generating and producing images that are statistically identical to uh, training data. So there's a, there's a range of diagnostics that, uh, that we can bring to bear on this problem. 
uh, you know, Emily work, walked through um, the diagnostics that, that people use. You know, mostly I think you appeal to perceptual uh, quality. So you know, can you make out whether this image is fake or not, or how artistic it might be, so on and so forth. I think the neat thing in science is that we, with every task, I think there can be a quantitative metric that you can propose. And in this case, I think we did have you know, a few power spectra based diagnostics that convinced us that the GAN was doing the right thing. All right, so switching from cosmology to astronomy, um, you know, one of my favorite projects is, is Celeste. Um, and um, essentially what we did in Celeste was to uh, propose a graphical model. I think Emily walked you through uh, you know, graphical models and variational inference. Uh, so we, we did the right thing. I think we had statisticians work with astronomers uh, to propose a graphical model that will essentially capture the dependence between galaxies and stars and how CCD counts might arise on, on a sensor. Um, and um, you know, over time, I think what we found is that purely relying on variational inference uh, doesn't quite work. Uh, the estimates aren't quite as accurate. So I think what, one of the things that we've tried to do over time is to replace some of the boxes in, in this less graphical model with deep learning. So essentially, uh, what we now do is to uh, replace uh, uh, you know, a mixture of Gaussians that we were using earlier in this less graphical model with a variational autoencoder that does a better job at modeling spatial distributions of galaxies. So that seems to, you know, again, work, work quite well. You know, a completely different domain, again, um, uh, we'll have Ben Nachman talk about the LHC next. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the Large Hadron Collider is an exquisite instrument. It's the, one of the most expensive instruments in science. Um, it can produce data at the rate of a petabyte a second. Uh, there is no file system, no computer system in the world that can handle data volumes at, at, at that rate. So uh, often what physicists will do is to encode particle detection logic in FPGAs right next to the detector so that you can throw away, discard uninteresting data um, and reduce the data volume to a gigabyte a second. At that point, you know, the data is bled off to other disks and so on and so forth. So uh, I, what we did uh, again a few years ago was to explore whether this hand-tuned, hand-crafted particle detection logic that is baked onto the FPGAs, whether that can be replaced by a convolutional architecture. And again, sure enough, a fairly vanilla AlexNet style architecture was able to beat the physics baseline substantially. And again, now, you know, the LHC community has dozens of workshops in, in deep learning, and many folks have now improved upon this baseline. So I think for, you know, a range of uh, detectors, uh, you know, if you care about uh, particle class, uh, classification problems, and you've had, if you used hand-tuned logic in the past, it's worth re-examining uh, and, and coming back and seeing if deep learning can, can provide for a replacement. And, uh, you know, we're not going to chat about inference here at all, but um, you can certainly take trained models, you can compress them, quantize them, uh, and essentially bake them into FPGAs or other special purpose logic right next to the instrument, and chances are that you're going to get good performance as, as well. So Steve Farrell, sitting right here, um, has really, I, I think, led the charge in exploring graph neural nets uh, and essentially solving the, the track, uh, uh, tracking problem. So uh, you may have you know, onion ring-like uh, detector arrays uh, around the LHC. Uh, and when, when the collision happens, uh, you know, particles will hit detectors. And your job is to chain them up in the form of track. So uh, this can be formulated as a graph problem. I'm sure that you know, Steve is going to touch upon that, hopefully in, a, in the post session later. Uh, but I think one of the things that we've been uh, exploring and have found is that uh, graph neural networks can do better than the conventional methods that the LSC folks have used so far. Last year, um, we worked on a different detector. So this is something called the ice cube detector. It's, it's in Antarctica, so under the ice sheet. Um, uh, it, there are essentially holes that we drilled in with uh, these sensors being deployed um, in, in these arrays, that's the Eiffel Tower for scale. Uh, and essentially neutrinos stream through the universe, they hit this detector array. Uh, so a few of these domes will light up and your job is to figure out which signatures correspond to your neutrino versus some other background uh, uh, you know, radiation. Um, so again, that community was using a certain physics baseline hand-tuned by postdocs over a decade and by using a 3D convolution network and now a graph convolution network we can effectively improve on the sensitivity of this of this um, uh, experiment. So this won the uh, the ICMLA Best Paper Award last year um, as well. So I think this is one of the first uh, useful applications of graph neural nets to a, a scientific problem. All right. So I'm going to come back to this 
this table, you know, the reason I brought this up early on, um, um, so I, I guess we'll come to that reason now. So essentially, you know, this is the landscape of uh, problems. The majority of them are in the data analytics space. There are some simulation and control problems. And essentially, I think over the last five years, uh, what we've learned is that these architectures, you know, are, are relevant and can be applied for these problems. I think early on on Monday, there was a question from somewhere there in the audience on what architecture should I use and, you know, when does it make sense to apply deep learning? So I would say that in general, you know, start with statistics, uh, then try some simple machine learning models, uh, and then depending on your problem characteristic, apply a deep learning architecture. So uh, if you have data, if you have a label data that is, and you have a supervised problem essentially, uh, depending on the nature of your problem, if you have a 2D image, uh, a 2D convolutional architecture may be a reasonable point to start. If you have a 3D volume, a 3D convolutional architecture might make sense. If your data set is unstructured or if there is a natural graph property to that data set, you can explore a graph convolution net. Uh, you know, I think I'm told that Luke gave a really good talk earlier this morning on uh, sequences. So, you know, while we don't really have language from, strictly speaking, you know, at, 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 at uh, Berkeley Lab, there are some in text modeling. But uh, you can treat time as a sequence, um, and then LSTMs or RNNs can be applied there. And of course, you know, if you have space-time problems, then you can, uh, you can create hybrid architectures that either do space-time convolutions or there is a hybrid LSTM, you know, convolutional architecture. So that's, you know, maybe something general to keep in mind for, and I would say that across the board, uh, whenever there's been enough training data, I think we've seen state of the art accuracy. So this I'm quite confident is working and is working well. Now for unsupervised prompts, uh, you know, we have explored autoencoders for looking at, you know, the intrinsic dimensionality of a data set, uh, finding clusters in the data set, so on and so forth. But I would say that our results aren't as conclusive. Um, so I think in some cases it's worked, others not as much, and it certainly is harder to, uh, uh, to I guess, get unstuck once this is not working. For surrogate models, you know, I, I touched upon Mustafa's Cosmo GAN project. Ben Nachman is going to talk about CaloGAN. There are certainly other people exploring GANs for simulation. So that, uh, I think, is quite relevant and potentially a methodology for enhancing simulations. Uh, I think there is some speculation that variational order encoders could also work in this space. For control problems, almost certainly reinforcement learning techniques that are being successfully applied can be applied to scientific domains. I think much of the challenge is that um, our experiments aren't really uh, hardwired. There isn't really an end-to-end -end loop which uh, allows for the possibility of collecting a lot of training data and then instrumentation that you can you know, essentially take a signal from an automated reinforcement learning system and plug it in. So that's going to take a little bit more time to work on. Now, anomaly detection is a question mark in my mind. It's not clear to me yet whether deep learning is the right solution. Uh, so I think for the time being, you know, well thought through statistical procedures are likely going to be good enough, but remains to be seen, uh, you know, if, if deep learning is the principal solution to anomaly detection. Now, by definition, anomalies are, uh, you know, events that you have very, very few data, very little data for. So, uh, so anyways, I think it remains to be seen whether deep learning is the right methodology. All right. So after having done this for five years, um, you know, I think there are a few things that we've learned along the way. So I think there are some short-term challenges now that we are better able to articulate, and then there are some longer-term challenges. So I just want to walk you through what you know, we see are, are the short-term challenges. So complex data is, is natural to science, right? So um, even though on the web there's a lot of complexity around images and video and text, uh, I think there's much more complexity in science. You know, our data comes in all form factors. 2D images, 3D volumes, uh, 4D space-time data sets, multispectral uh, you know, imaging. Um, sometimes the data is, is dense, but also sometimes the data is natively sparse. Uh, sometimes a graph structure is really the best way to represent your data set. So you know, if you download something like Keras or PyTorch or TensorFlow, does that natively support these kinds of data at this point in time? So, anyway, so I think making sure that the entire software infrastructure can natively support these modalities, that's an issue. Hyperparameter optimization is an issue. I think later, maybe tomorrow or, or, or today, um, you know, you're going to have a talk on, on HPO. Uh, just because you read something on the web, you know, you maybe coded up AlexNet, doesn't mean that uh, that's the best choice for this architecture. So if you go ahead and you write a paper saying, oh, you know, I chose AlexNet, I got 85% as my accuracy, here's the paper, it's a new, you know, state of the art. Uh, you, you need to be a little more rigorous about it. You need to, you know, at least do some, have some attempt at exploring some reasonable architectures that could have done better. 
And really, I think there are very few people at Google and Facebook and OpenAI who really know how all of these parameters interact with each other. So how many layers should you use, learning rate schedules, so on and so forth. So uh, I think what we need are automated capabilities so that all of you don't have to become experts in HPO. Uh, but you know, folks at supercomputing centers and, and the cloud can essentially deploy some of these capabilities that you can then use. Now, performance and scaling is, is certainly an issue. I think if you have a data set that's uh, a gigabyte or tens of gigabytes in size and you try to train on that, uh, chances are that it's gonna take hours and days. And if one network is gonna take you hours and days, then there is no way that you're gonna be doing hyperparameter optimization. Now, if you're you know, amongst the chosen few who, whose domain actually has tens of terabytes, hundreds of terabytes or more, uh, and you'd like to apply deep learning to these data sets, that's, there's no way that that's gonna happen on a single machine. So it is really quite important that deep learning run in a performant way on single node architectures, but then also scale to multi-node architectures. And that's the reason why you know, we at NERSC and others in the DOE have been really pushing hard on scaling deep learning. Now this, so these I, you know, I sort of view as technical challenges. I think uh, the computer scientists, the engineers can certainly address those. But this is a, you know, this is more of a sociological challenge. If a domain, you know, some domain in biology or some, you know, some neuroscientist somewhere, if you just do not have training data at all, no label data, then what are you gonna do? Um, so it seems like a you know, crime at this point in time to not explore deep learning. Uh, I guess one should explore deep learning, but if you don't have labeled data, then you're stuck. So essentially, I think what we are finding, at least in the domains that I've seen, as people are coming to the realization that if only I could have enough labeled data, I can convert this to a supervised problem, and hence I can you know, apply the deep learning hammer. Uh, I think much of the emphasis is now shifting towards how do we go about acquiring, arranging labeled data sets. So this, you know, I don't think computer scientists can do this. Computer scientists can develop systems like Amazon Mechanical Turk. They can develop web portals, but really it's up to the domain science community to come together and run labeling campaigns and so on and so forth. So this is much of a sociological challenge, which I think will, will play out in, in the coming years. All right, so I think these are actually easy. I think, you know, one way or the other, we're gonna get to these in the next, uh, you know, one to three years. But the longer term challenges, I think are, uh, are worth noting. And I think you know, many of you are getting started in your careers and uh, you know, are obviously interested in deep learning for science. So one, I think you should be aware of these. And two, um, you know, if, if you have an opportunity to write a grant or, or lead an exciting program, then maybe something you, this is something you can think of. So one, um, I, I think the, the lack of theory in deep learning definitely bugs a lot of people. And I think it's bugging a lot of domain scientists to the extent that they don't wanna adopt these methods. Um, so I think as uh, methodologists, as practitioners, it behooves us, I think, to think about characterizing what the limits really are. So, I mean, you can't say that this thing is going to get more and more powerful. Just get me more data. Just get me more compute. That's not going to work. So I think we need to characterize what the limits really are. So what are the limits of supervised architectures? What are the limits of unsupervised architectures? What are the limits of semi-supervised architectures? So I think we need to say something there. You know, frankly, GANs are looking really, really intriguing. I mean, I think the, the face results there were just amazing. You know, we are seeing promising results in science as well. But I think the question that one of you asked around the generalization limits of GANs, that's a central issue. Uh, if all of your training has happened in a certain parameter regime, what can you say about the GAN making predictions in, a, you know, in, a, in an extrapolated regime? So we really have to get, uh, you know, make some statements about the generalization properties of GANs. All right, so the, the interpretability issue is, is again quite fundamental. Again, you know, a domain science may have a well-established workflow, and now you're gonna pull out an analytics piece and drop in a deep learning piece, and suddenly this workflow becomes a black box. And uh, again, some people are not comfortable with that. Um, so I think there are maybe two ways of just thinking about this. One is to build in interpretability. Uh, so if you know something about your domain science, uh, if you know that uh, the, the domain, you know, some laws, so conservation laws, PDEs, so on and so forth are relevant to that domain, then you should build it in. Um, the other is to introspect it or visualize it. So if, if I have an architecture that's doing wonderfully well, and, um, you know, I, I would like to use that uh, de facto in my, in my workflow, then I think we need to be able to explain what this network does. So visualizing it, explaining what the network is learning in terms of semantic features that, uh, that are relevant to the domain, I, I think we, we just need to have those tools. Um, 
Now, uncertainty quantification is also important. Again, I think it's just mentioned maybe a few times that in science, apart from the observation, the error bars are equally important. So we do have to say something about how confident the, the network is, how much uncertainty perhaps do we have you know, in, in the whole network. Um, uh, and essentially, I think develop more techniques for end-to-end -end uncertainty quantification, which you know, not enough people have looked at so far. I'm gonna to get to this slide next, because uh, I, I think it is worth calling this out. Um, so frankly, I think um, uh, the deep learning protocol as it exists right now um, is very simple, right? So somehow you get more data uh, and just throw more data at your deep learning architecture. Uh, and then, you know, if you have underfitting, throw more complex from a more complex architecture at, at, at your data set. So this, this protocol, you know, throw more data or throw more complex network at, at the, at the problem is, is just not satisfying. I mean, I think if you were to establish a contrast to say how applied mathematicians have thought about computational modeling over the last 40 years, you know, the way they go about it is they, they think about what physical system am I studying? You know, climate system, the earth system, so on and so forth. They think about what governing equations might be relevant to that system. Uh, they will design solvers. Um, uh, the solvers will typically have some analytical proof. Uh, they will then, you know, discretize the, the solver. They will think about things like CFL conditions that gives us a, gives them a handle on what processes can and cannot be resolved. They will think about convergence of of these solvers, uh, and then they you know think about the implementation on an on an HPC machine, do performance optimization, scaling, and so on and so forth. So this is how applied math has worked in the last forty years, and arguably they they've definitely succeeded in building bridges and building planes that we trust and trains and so on and so forth. Compare that again to the deep learning protocol. Uh, you know, this seems very, very simple. So, uh, so I think the, the question is in science, uh, as, as deep learning is applicable to science, if we know something about the domain, then how do we build a protocol that's more sophisticated? So I'm, I'm quite sure that this will happen, uh, that you know, we will be adapting and enhancing this protocol, but I think uh, you know, more effort is, is needed in this space. So I think coming back to the long-term challenges, I think these are really the problems that will, uh, that require attention over the next five to 10 years. It's not gonna happen in a year, it's gonna take much more time. Uh, but I think as a community, we really should be thinking about these and, and working on these. So I just wanna conclude. Um, so this was meant to be, I think, a, a broad sort of breakfast talk on uh, you know, how deep learning is, is making successful inroads into science. You know, we just touched upon some problems in cosmology, astronomy, climate. Some talks are coming up next on chemistry and, and high energy physics. You will note one common theme here in that all of these domains are computationally savvy. They have simulation tools, they have a handle on their data sets, you know, they have machinery in, in place. So I think that's what we are seeing that computationally savvy domains uh, are adapting and have been successful in, in applying deep learning to their workflows. But domains that have not been computationally savvy, so don't want to pick on examples, but there are many. Uh, I think they are having a harder time. Um, there are certainly you know, a lot of opportunities in this space, in the deep learning for science space, to work on societally important problems. So I think you, know, you all should, should certainly think of that. You know, I characterize two classes of challenges, um, some short term, one to three years. You know, I think they, they will happen. But then there are certainly some long term challenges that take you know, five to 10 years to solve. Um, and you know, we, we are certainly open to collaboration. I think one of the, the reasons we are having this event here um, in that you know, we've been working on this area for a number of years now. There are plenty of opportunities to work on domain science problems, think about the theory of some of the, the longer term challenges, think about software and hardware infrastructure for the short term challenges. So if any of these sound interesting to you, you know, please come and talk to us. Uh, so there are certainly you know, summer internships that are available. I think some of you were, were uh, asking about that. So, you know, the group hires 10 to 15 interns every summer. You're welcome to let us know if you're interested. We have something called the NESAP, the NERSC Exascale Application Readiness Program, and we are now hiring postdocs for that program. So, uh, you know, if you care about some of these applications and optimizing them and scaling them on big machines, there are opportunities for that. And, uh, you know, going forward, I think as these town halls kick in and there's going to be a you know, bunch of top-down funding, I do anticipate there'll be staffing opportunities. So, if you're interested in you know, research positions or engineering positions, there are certainly you know, opportunities here at NASC. All right, so I'm gonna stop there and I'm happy to take questions.
Yes, I think you know one way you can fill a big machine is what is called the capacity mode. So you know independent uh, networks running on you know independent nodes, and the other is capability mode. So one network running in a synchronized fashion. So we were certainly in the second bucket. So there was one network running in a data parallel fashion on all of Summit. There was another team, a Gordon Bell finalist from Oak Ridge, that was running essentially doing hyperparameter tuning at scale. Yes, I think uh, you know data sharing has really been a long-standing issue. I would say in the science community and. It's been unclear who really owns that problem. Uh, I think deep learning will bring that problem to the fore. So I guess I can say this. I think there is definitely a desire now in the community to create a hub for both models and data sets. Um, and you as you know, domain scientist may choose to, right now, I mean, if you go to NERSC, you can certainly uh, put up your data in a repository and make it publicly available. Um, uh, you know, we can have Globus endpoints connected to that so that the download is, is easier. So I think there'll be more robust support for sharing data sets going forward. I think that's gonna happen one way or the other. I think the new unique uh, requirement that's coming up now is around model sharing. So again, you, know, you develop your five architectures, you write your paper, you move on. The next material scientist who comes along, you know, what does he or she learn from you? So if you're open to sharing your model as well beyond just your data set, then there should be a mechanism for them to tap into you know, the, the networks you, you've obtained. And again, you know, we talked about this hyperparameter optimization problem. If they, uh, they just want to tweak your model in a few ways, uh, then you know, they ought to be able to do that. And uh, you know, if they just start from scratch, they may never get to whatever you were able to achieve. So, uh, so anyways, I think um, um, there are mechanisms for sharing data sets right now at NERSC. You can use those. Uh, I guess all I'm pointing out is that there will be enhanced capabilities for sharing models as well. But uh, you know, in some ways, we are sort of beating around the bush of scientific reproducibility. Um, uh, you know, the, the hope is that eventually anyone outside your group, anyone in science, can reproduce your figure, you know, your deep learning accuracy for the data set that you had. And I feel that um, with a Jupyter notebook, with a model repository, with a data repository, that's going to happen. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess maybe you have a few questions. One is around the labeling procedure, not showing all the fields. So that is an easy one. So I think you know, we are working on uh, options so that multiple variables as being relevant to a task can be displayed simultaneously or you can toggle between them. So that is a, more of a UI question and that I think we, you know, we, we are working on. Um, but the, the associated question I guess that you raised is, you know, there are all these questions around uh, impact oriented questions around the damage or you know, what happens when these things make landfall. And almost certainly you'll have to consider all the variables for doing that analysis or training a model. Um, I, I guess all I can you know, say in my defense is that um, um, you really don't need a supercomputer for every single problem that you have. Um, so it may be the case that once we have, and that's, that is the vision for climate net, once you have enough label data, we create a unified model that does a good job of, of segmenting these known patterns. And then perhaps there is a new pattern that you come in with. And at that point, uh, you know, you don't need to retrain the network or train it from scratch. Maybe there is some transfer learning that you can do uh, to adapt, um, uh, you know, some of the later layers in, in your architecture for this new problem that, that, that is more, more relevant to you. So, uh, so I think my hope is that with transfer learning, we'll be able to circumvent that, that issue. Now, that having been said, I mean, you know, why do these big supercomputing centers exist? I mean, it is so that you can take on problems of this kind. So if there is a completely new domain, you know, cryo EN, and you now have a gold standard data set for cryo EN, uh, but these pics, these images are 10K by 10K by, you know, 1K, and, uh, you know, you really have to train a network, you know, data parallel, model parallel, uh, at scale, then that's, that's why we are here. I mean, that's, you know, that's the reason why we work with the industry to develop tools that can scale to that extent. So I feel that I think once a few key people in different domains have led the charge in creating a few central models, uh, then other people will be able to adapt uh, their, their networks. But someone certainly has to take the initiative to run these models at scale. And I think you can team up with you know, people in the DOE or the NSF to make that happen. All right, good. So I guess you can uh, enjoy 15 minutes of sunlight and uh, I guess we'll continue on at 1.30. Thank you.